Welcome to chapter two of Explorations, an open invitation to biological anthropology. Chapter two is going to focus on evolution. So the topics we're gonna to cover today are the difference between Darwin and Lamarck in terms of what they believed for evolution, the idea of natural versus artificial selection, explaining the process of natural selection, looking at gradualism versus punctuated equilibrium, and then discussing the modern synthesis of uh, the theory of evolution, which adds genetics, and finally some misconceptions about evolution. So Jean-Baptiste Lamarck believed in something called uh, the inheritance of acquired traits. And in the picture on the bottom left, what you can see, this is a typical example, is that he believed that if an animal was able to modify its body during its own lifetime, it could pass that modification on. So the idea of a giraffe, the ancestor of the giraffe, which would have had a short neck, that because it's stretching its neck to reach uh, a taller leaf on, a, on a, a tree, its neck is gonna get a little bit longer and then it's gonna pass that trait on. And then the next generation, they're gonna stretch their necks and then it's gonna get longer and so forth. So he basically thought that if you uh, had this modification during the organism's own lifetime, the child could inherit that. In comparison, Darwin proposed something called the theory of natural selection. So he believed in descent with modification. There, yes, uh, the, the offspring are going to inherit something from the parents. However, it's not something that happened during that organism's own lifetime. So it's not a, a change, a biological change that happened during their lifetime. Instead, it's something else. And the idea of that seems pretty obvious to us nowadays. Like for example, let's say uh, you're a brunette, okay? You have brown hair. Just because you bleach your brown hair blonde doesn't mean that you can have a child that's blonde, okay? So we know that there's genetic background on what you can pass on to your children. But during Darwin's time, we didn't understand genetics. We didn't know about DNA. So his theory was able to explain why animals looked the way that they did, why they had certain traits. And his explanation was this idea of natural selection, that there are certain traits which benefit the organism. So if you look in the bottom right, he's saying that in a population of giraffes, so this is again, ancestor giraffes, some of them would have very short necks, some of them might have medium sized necks, some of them might have slightly longer necks. But the differences could be really subtle, you know, maybe there, there's only a few inches difference in terms of which giraffe had a longer neck. But because there's an advantage to having that longer neck. So the one that whose neck is maybe just a couple inches longer, that one has an advantage. That's gonna help it survive. It's going to get more food or it's going to be able to you know, uh, reach a higher branch. And because it's able to survive, when it reproduces, it's gonna pass on that positive trait. The organisms that do not have the positive trait, they start to die off. So the giraffe who could not reach that high branch eventually it starves to death and it didn't have the opportunity to have children and pass on its trait. So just over many generations, the ones with the longer necks become more and more common. And that's really important. So it's, it's not that the giraffe did something during its own lifetime to make it better. Instead, it just by accident happened to have this mutation, this trait with the longer neck. And they're the ones that survived and reproduced. Over time, eventually the short neck giraffes can go extinct. And so, it does take time for this to happen. The other thing is that the advantage trait, the advantage of that trait is something that's gonna help with either the survival or the reproduction of the organism. In this case, it was to get food, but it could also be uh, for something like escaping predators, you know, being really fast or having better camouflage. There's many different traits. It depends on the situation. Now we did eventually disprove Lamarck and there's a kind of a disturbing experiment that disproved it. So uh, here's a picture of that experiment, the Weissman mouse tail experiment. Basically what he did was he cut the tails of these mice and then let them reproduce and found that the offspring still had long tails. And if you cut those tails and let them reproduce, the offspring still had long tails. So just because you cut the tail off the mouse doesn't mean that it would pass on that trait of a short tail. And we know of course now that that's because of genetics and because it's the genetics that control the length of the tail in the mouse. So a little bit about Charles Darwin and natural selection. So Charles Darwin, uh, the, the time period when he came up with this theory was during his journey around the world. 
So he took this voyage around the world in the 1830s, and he was able to see lots of really interesting things. He traveled to South America, and he saw fossils, he saw living animals there, and he visited a very special place called the Galapagos Islands. The Galapagos Islands are found off the coast of Ecuador in South America. And the reason they're, they're really interesting is because there are many unique species that live there that aren't found anywhere else in the world. And while he was there and he was investigating what was going on, he noticed that there were birds on this island, they're called the Galapagos finches, and that the most distinctive trait of these birds was that different ones had different sized beaks. And he noticed that based on the size of the beak, the bird would eat different kinds of food. So in this image on the bottom right, the, the one all the way on the right, the really, really big beaked bird, that one would eat seeds off the ground. It's called a, a ground finch. Then the ones in the middle with the smaller beaks, they were more likely to be eating insects. And then there were also some that would drink nectar and so forth. So there are many different kinds of finches. But he also noticed that they had a lot in common with the South American finch. So the South American finch, which lived in the main continent, still had many traits in common with these birds. It just didn't have the same beak. And that's when he started thinking like, well, why, what's going on? And so he came up with this theory, the theory of natural selection, which is saying that the reason the beaks evolved to be different is because it benefited those birds to eat certain types of food. So the ones with the bigger beaks were able to crack the nuts and the seeds, the ones with the thinner beaks were able to catch the insects and so forth. And that's when he started thinking about this. It took him a long time to gather enough evidence to write his book. And the book is called The Origin of Species. Um, and it has many, many different examples, not just the finches, but many other animals as well. You've probably heard the term survival of the fittest. So I just wanted to let you know that was not a term coined by Darwin. Darwin's theory is called natural selection and he used the term descent with modification. The idea of survival of the fittest was by another man called Spencer. And just so you understand, fittest doesn't always necessarily mean like the strongest or the fastest, because if you look at, um, at something like a snail, a snail is clearly very slow and delicate, but it's fit for its own environment. So snails often live on plants and they're hiding kind of in the, the dirt and the leaves. So even though they're slow, they have a shell to protect them against most of their predators and they get along fine. So they don't need to be fast, they just need to be fit for their own environment. The other thing I wanted to mention is there are some other terms that are a little bit different than natural selection. So natural selection has to do with surviving and reproducing in the environment, okay? It's nature that is creating a situation where one trait is more beneficial than the other. But there's another type of selection called artificial selection. In artificial selection, this is something that humans have created. So through the domestication of plants and animals, we have selected certain traits that we thought were better than other traits. So example in this uh, image are the different dog breeds. All dogs are descended from the gray wolf. So the wild gray wolf is their ancestor. And of course there are modern gray wolves that still exist, but the domestic dog has been domesticated for thousands of years. And so its genetics is more unique and there are many traits that have evolved. There are colors in modern dogs that are not in existence in wolves. The shape of the face has clearly changed. We have um, dogs that have very short snouts. We have dogs that are very tall, dogs that are very short, long bodied, um, you know, super tiny like chihuahuas. And we've bred them for different traits that we as humans thought were beneficial. So there's the hunting breeds, there's the ones that are really large and they like pull carts or pull people. There's ones that like water, ones that run really fast. All of those traits were artificially selected by humans because we were able to choose which animal we allowed to breed and which animal we did not allow to breed. So again, that's artificial selection. In the wild, it's nature that's creating a scenario where the animal would be better able to survive and find mates. So that brings up another term I want you to be familiar with called sexual selection. Sexual selection is just a, a subtype of natural selection. It's the idea that the trait specifically has been selected for because it helps that animal reproduce. So the idea of a trait that's going to be preferred by one sex over the other. What do I mean by that? Well, probably the simplest example is the peacock. 
So in a peacock, the male and the female peacock look very different. The, the female is just kind of brownish gray. She doesn't have very long tail feathers and she has the same body shape, okay? But she's much duller in color. And this is pretty typical of birds where the male has extravagant colorful plumage. He also sings a lot to try to attract a female and that's sexual selection. So why does he behave different from her? Why does he look different from her? Because he's trying to attract a mate. And depending on what the female finds desirable, okay, so the colorful plumage or the, the specific song, that is the trait that's going to be passed on to the next generation. Next, I'm gonna talk about two terms called gradualism versus punctuated equilibrium. These are basically explanations for how quickly evolution can occur. Now, evolution does require changes in the DNA, um, which doesn't happen super fast, but they do happen with every generation. There can be changes in DNA. Those are just simple mutations. We all have them. And let me just go over the, the definition first before I do the, the examples. So punctuated equilibria is the idea that species are stable through time and then are formed very rapidly uh, relative to their duration. So something happens in the environment that causes a rapid shift and change in their, in their biology. The opposite is that species are unstable and constantly changing through time. So that's, it kind of makes sense, right? Gradualism, that they're changing gradually over time. So I have two examples for you here. On the right, we have the evolution of the modern horse. So we know that horses evolved from an ancestor that used to have a lot more toes. This is really interesting, actually. We have a lot of fossil evidence of this. If you look at the little creature at the very bottom of the picture, it still has five toes. By the time you get to the second lowest animal, only three of the toes are being walked on. And the other two toes have basically uh, shrunk so much that they're not useful at all anymore. Then in the, the Merikippus over there, we have the middle toe has gotten much larger and toes number two and four are really small and they're just kind of like sticking out a little bit, but they're no, long, no longer supporting the weight of the animal. And finally, by the time you get to the modern equus, it's literally standing on a single toe. So when you look at a, at a horse's leg and you look at its hoof, the hoof is basically the toenail of a single toe. So they are running around on four legs, but their four legs are just individual toes. But this Adaptation has allowed the horse to run really, really fast, okay? And if you look at other animals um, that have more toes, it's usually because they still have things like claws, they have to be able to dig, they have to be able to grasp or climb. Horses can't climb, right? They can't go up a tree, they can't uh, dig holes or anything like that, but they can run really fast. Then on the left-hand side, we have a picture of a horseshoe crab. So the reason I have this picture is because this horseshoe crab looks basically identical to fossils of horseshoe crabs that we have found that are millions and millions of years old. So if we find a million, million, million year old uh, horseshoe crab, it looks like it hasn't changed at all. So based on that, can you tell me which would be an example of gradualism and which one would be an example of punctuated equilibrium? So if you've had some time to think about it, the horse is an example of gradualism, okay? Because clearly the fossils show that gradually the toes change to get smaller and smaller and smaller and the middle toe got bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually the modern horse evolved. And this took many millions of years. You can see in the, in the graph, uh, we're starting as much as 50 million years ago. On the other hand, the horseshoe crab hasn't really changed at all. So that would be punctuated equilibrium because one example of punctuated equilibrium is when a species doesn't really change. Okay, it's very stable. Then sometimes you have very rapid changes that occur. Usually what we see with that, it would be something like um, the evolution of the bat where we know that the bat clearly evolved wings and the ancestor of the bat did not have wings but we don't have fossil evidence showing that gradual progression like we do with the horse, which means it probably happened so rapidly that there was simply not enough time for enough fossils to be formed. We'll learn more about fossils in the future, but fossils are actually relatively rare uh, since organic materials usually decompose over time. So to get a fossil, which is um, you know, a rock version of the skeleton, 
it's not that easy to get. And so if a species evolves very rapidly, then we're not gonna see these transitional species in between. Instead, we're gonna see an old version and the new version and kind of nothing in between because it just happens so rapidly. So now let's look at modern evolutionary theory. The evolutionary synthesis is basically a combination of Darwin's theory of natural selection and adding genetics to it. So we were able to add something called Mendelian genetics, which we'll talk about more later. Um, there's a man called Gregor Mendel who studied inheritance patterns. And he looked at things like dominant and recessive genes. Maybe you've heard of that. So dominant traits versus recessive traits. We also have something called population genetics. And so the combination of all of that information creates a new modern synthesis. This is important because even though Darwin did understand that the animals were passing their traits on to the next generation, he didn't understand how that was happening. So he didn't know about DNA. He didn't understand genetics. He, did, he never did studies or experiments on that, but Gregor Mendel did. So he did a lot of experiments on genetics and he was able to explain the patterns of inheritance. And with our modern theory, we're able to bring those pieces of information together. So some vocabulary related to this, is macroevolution and microevolution. When you think of Charles Darwin and the theory of natural selection, you're thinking of macroevolution. You're looking at the evolution of a new species. So like in the picture before, how did the modern horse evolve from this ancestor that had many toes? They're completely new species. Or the same thing with the giraffe, right? How did the modern giraffe with a long neck evolve from the ancestor that had a short neck? Those are different species. In microevolution, we're looking at the change in allele frequencies within a population. So what does that mean? It means we're looking at the genetics of a single species. They have not become a new species yet. That's not what's going on. But the genes of one group in that species is different than the genes of another group in that species. And there's going to be some vocabulary related to that, like gene pool, mutations, gene flow, genetic drift. We'll talk about those in a lot more detail in the future. But an easy example would be something like the dog breeds, where we know that different dogs can mate with each other successfully and produce puppies. Therefore, they're still the same species. But we also know that the genetics of, for example, a Dalmatian are very different than the genetics of a poodle because their hair and fur, different textures, different colors, the shape of their face is different, the shape of their ears and tails. So those are all caused by mutations and changes in their genes. And we can look at those allele frequencies. Now, again, remember that dog breeds are artificial because humans have bred them, but we can look at natural populations as well. So we could go out and study, for example, a population of deer, and we could look at a population of deer in one part of Pennsylvania and a population of deer in another part of Pennsylvania, and we could do some DNA analysis and see whether their DNA is similar or different and how long ago that population split up. So the gene flow has to do with whether the populations are still interbreeding or not. And then there's something called genetic drift. Genetic drift is just random short-term changes in the gene pool. So these are random mutations, random changes that happen with non-adaptive effects. What that means is that those deer that I just gave the example of, the deer in the two different populations, they haven't separated for long enough for one of them to evolve to become better than the other or to be better fit for their environment. It's just that because they're no longer interbreeding, they're, they're mating only with the members of their own population. So certain genes become more frequent. And we will talk about the consequences of inbreeding because that can be a problem. Okay, so when the population of individuals that are there to select uh, from for mates is very small, you get inbreeding. And inbreeding can cause negative mutations to become more common, and that can be detrimental to that group of animals. Now, finally, I want to talk about something called epigenetics. Epigenetics is a very new concept. It's the, the idea of how can it be that something has the same DNA, but doesn't end up looking identical or behaving identically. So what's going on with that? The example here, the picture in the bottom left, is of several different cells in the body. And the idea is that if you are an individual person, all of the cells in your body have the exact same DNA, okay? The exact same 100% identical DNA. So how is it that in your own body, some of those cells are gonna behave like skin cells, some of them are going to behave like brain cells, some are going to behave like smooth muscle cells or liver cells. How are they able to behave differently? when they have the same instructions, because that's what DNA is, okay? DNA is the instructions for the cell on what to do. Well, there's something called epigenetics, which is basically uh, which parts of the DNA are active, okay? So epigenetics is the study of how genetically identical cells and organisms with the same DNA can still 
end up looking or behaving differently. And another example with, of this that you can maybe identify with is the idea of uh, identical twins. So identical twins have the exact same DNA. They're different from fraternal twins. In fraternal twins, uh, the mother released two eggs and each of those eggs were fertilized by different sperm. So fraternal twins are no more similar than regular siblings. Identical twins, on the other hand, come from a single egg that was fertilized by one sperm. And during the embryonic development, they split, okay? So they're, they're completely identical in terms of DNA. And a lot of times those babies and small children look very, 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 very similar. But over time, especially if you look at identical twins who are maybe uh, older adults now, they can look quite different. And you might wonder, well, how can they look different from each other? Because how the DNA is expressed or not expressed is influenced by the environment. It can be influenced by exposure to different chemicals, to different things like radiation, um, exposure to different kinds of foods. All of that can influence whether the DNA is shut down or activated. All right, so here's a review question for you. Golden Eldridge argued that species change and adapt more when they are being formed and then remain mostly stable over time. What did they call this idea? Was it punctuated equilibrium, phyletic gradualism, quick and slow evolution, or epigenetics? So go ahead and pause for a second and think about which vocabulary word best explains this concept. All right, are you ready for the answer? So hopefully you picked punctuated equilibrium because that explains the idea that most of the time they're stable, they're not changing, but then all of a sudden they can uh, change very rapidly. Okay, next question for you. White blood cells, skin cells, and nerve cells all have the same DNA sequence. Nevertheless, white blood cells can only produce white blood cells and skin cells can only make more skin cells. Waddington called this type of cellular inheritance A, synonymous mutations, B, epigenetic, C, plasticity, or D, canalization. So the best answer for this topic is B, epigenetics. Again, it has to do with, even though that they have the same DNA, only some DNA is going to be expressed in specific types of cells. The last concept here is something called eugenics. So eugenics is a, a theory that kind of became uh, popular in the 1920s, where since we learned about genetic inheritance, some people thought that we could improve society and we could improve humanity by only allowing certain types of people to breed and reproduce and have children and not allowing other people to breed. So of course, this is a very controversial topic because it can cause um, laws and um, sometimes really harsh repercussions for certain groups of people that other people consider to be undesirable. And the biggest, of course, like most famous case would be in World War II where the Nazis decided that they did not like people of Jewish ancestry and decided to just eliminate all of them. And that kind of behavior, the idea of genocide of entire race of people or entire group of people does still exist, unfortunately, in the world today because one group decides that their genes and their society is better than another group. So definitely when you're taking this class, think about why do humans have different diversity and different uh, biology? And the idea that variation is actually a good thing for a species. It's good to have lots of different variation and it's not good for everyone to be identical to each other. Finally, let's discuss some misconceptions about evolution. So often people say, well, evolution is just a theory, right? It's, it's not proven. Remember that a theory in terms of scientific theory means that actually there's been a lot of evidence supporting that theory. So when we talk about evolution, okay, the theory part is actually the, the theory of natural selection. That the idea that evolution is occurring, that species can change over time, that their DNA can change, that's been proven over and over and over again by lots of data where we can see after several generations, the DNA is clearly different than it used to be. So evolution is not a theory. Evolution is a fact, but why is it happening? What's going on in the environment to cause these changes? That's where the theory of evolution comes in, 
um, in terms of natural selection. So that's the explanation for why. Okay, and that theory can continue to be changed based on new evidence that we gather, just like I told you how Mendelian genetics and population genetics, when we added that to Darwin's original theory, we created a more robust theory by adding new evidence. And again, it can be disproven by additional evidence in the future. So as we gather more information, we can refine theories. That's really important in scientific thought. The next piece of information that I did, individuals evolve. So that's not true, okay? An individual person cannot evolve because your DNA is not gonna change within your own body. You can have mutations, but those mutations are usually only going to affect a small subset of your cells. So an example would be like cancer. Okay, why does cancer happen? Because a mutation happened in one of your cells and instead of the cell controlling when it divides, it's now dividing uncontrollably. And that's why you develop a tumor. So cancer comes from mutation, but that's not something that you spread to the next generation. Okay, so you don't pass that on. So that's something that happens to you individually. Basically, the only way evolution can happen is when one individual passes their genes on to the next generation, and then that individual passes their genes on to the next generation and so forth. So it has to take many, many generations. It's not just going to be one person or one animal or one plant that evolves. Next, the idea that evolution explains the origin of life. So that has never been a goal of evolution. Evolution is just explaining why populations change and why species change over time. They're not trying to explain where we came from in terms of life in general. So we're not explaining where life on earth originated from. We're just talking about how animals and plants and all the other organisms on earth are related and why they look or behave the way that they do now. And then the last bit, this is actually a really uh, important point, the idea that organisms evolve on purpose. So that's not true. If you've heard of something called intelligent design, the idea of intelligent design is that there's someone guiding the evolution, okay? But that's not a scientific theory. That's kind of trying to combine religious aspects of a deity with, with the theory of evolution, trying to combine the two. But in terms of natural selection, there's no evidence that there's any sort of intelligent design behind it. It happens randomly and some organisms just by accident, just by a random mutation, have a trait that's beneficial. And when it's beneficial, it gets passed on and becomes more popular in that population. But it wasn't like it happened on purpose. And the reason that we know this is because if you could evolve on purpose, then you could just evolve new traits that you want, right? Like how cool would it be to fly? It would be amazing. I want to evolve wings. It's not going to happen that way. Okay, so I don't ev evolve wings just because I want it or because I need it. And in fact, many, many times, animals are not able to adapt to changes to their environment. So think of um, uh, an example where an environment gets much colder than it used to be. If the animal cannot adapt to that new environment and cannot get mutations that help it survive in the cold, then it's gonna die out. And that group of animals is gonna go extinct. And we see this happen all the time. Animals go, go extinct all the time. Uh, we have that in the fossil record and we certainly have it due to now because of human habitat destruction. So because we're destroying the natural habitat where animals evolved to be successful in that particular habitat, we're destroying that habitat and they're not able to evolve fast enough to, to adapt to those changes. So that's something that we need to consider you know, in terms of how we're affecting the environment. So that wraps up chapter two. Uh, see you next time.